Welcome in to the Boys Collective episode number 41. I'm going to call it the Dirt Nowitzki episode, not the 40 Burger Jeff episode, as Jeff would, I'm sure, like to call it. Right here on 105 Through the Fan here on YouTube. My name is Kevin Gray alongside Super Bowl winning scout and one-fourth of the G-Bag Nation. And joining us today, special guest, as requested by the people, another portion of the G-Bag Nation. You can find him on Twitter at JC1053. He is... Jeffrey Cavanaugh, gentlemen, happy game preview Friday to you this week. Woot woot! So I, um, I'm noticing I need Botox. Look at all the <laughs> forehead. Um, thanks, KG. It's nice to be here. Well, always glad to have you, Brian. Good to have you here. I'm sure you've been putting up with Jeff all week long because I'm sure every conceivable way that you've had to talk about the 49ers, you've done at this point, correct? Yeah, and I also, if Jeff needs Botox, I need a complete facelift. You know, that would probably help me. So, Come yeah, on, Brian, no, give yourself hey, some more credit. Give yourself some more oh, credit, Brian. You're a good looking you, man, okay? I okay. appreciate that. No, uh, yeah, and it, it, it's been a busy week. And, you know, because of the playoffs, and this is a really unique matchup. And I am excited to have Jeff on today because there has been a lot of discussion about directions that this team needs to go when it comes to this game. And, and again, there's a lot of great talking points uh, that we could surely cover. Uh, Jeff, would you like to say something as you raised your hand? No, I've just never realized on Zoom you could click all these little reaction things. So it's about this show. I hope people appreciate it because I'm going to post up a whole bunch of different ones while I talk. You can find us on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. You can find Brian on Twitter at Brian Broaddus. You can find Jeff on Twitter at JC1053. Of course, subscribe to 105 Through the Fan here on YouTube and, of course, 105ThroughTheFan.com and also Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 1053. It is our game preview show as we are getting you ready for the San Francisco 49ers visiting the Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys, of course, winners of the NFC East taking on the wild card San Francisco 49ers and Jeff's favorite football player, uh, Devo Samuel, coming to town, who used to terrorize hey. my Missouri Tigers, by the way, as when he's a member of South Carolina Gamecock. So, yeah. Let me, we'll let me go on record real quick before we get this started that Jeff mm-hmm. absolutely – he talked about this guy in every way that he's playing in the National Football League. I, I mm. there's, you know, they, Sometimes everybody wants to talk about, oh, who'd you miss? Who'd you miss? You remember those, but I want to give credit to Jeff because he had the vision for this player when we were working on that particular draft. He's like, man, hand the ball to him, throw the ball to him, whatever you had to do to get the ball to him, do that. And I, I do want to give Jeff credit because there's a lot of times you do remember, you know, the the guys that you missed along the way. So with that, we will jump in. Now, Jeff, this segment is called The Broadest File, so you don't have a segment just yet, okay? So just so just relax, but I'm going to come to you here in just a second. Uh, <laughs> the Broadest File is here. Look, let's start with some housekeeping items. Uh, as of about 25 minutes ago as we're recording this, the All-Pro teams have been named. The first team All-Pro team has been named, and Micah Parsons, Trayvon Diggs, and Zach Martin all named to the first team All-Pro team. Uh, Brian Anger was second team all pro for your Dallas Cowboys. So the Dallas Cowboys having three individuals on the first team all pro list. Your guys' thoughts will start with Brian on Micah Parsons, Trayvon Diggs, and Zach Martin being named to the all pro first team for the 2021 NFL season here. I'll tell you what, though, this is where it's, it's really, really cool because, again, I'll pull this thing back to the draft. All those guys, the draft gods smiled on you, all three of those players, if you think about it. You know, if you look with with the Zach Martin where he was picked, you know, Ryan Shazier was the card going in. Steelers grab him. Who do you get? Zach Martin. Just follow the board. Diggs, second round. They had first round uh, thoughts about him. But then you get CeeDee Lamb. You take him. But then Diggs is there at 60. Boom. You make that pick. You know, and then you look with Micah Parsons. You know, you had an idea. The corners go off the board. Your next available player defensively was Micah Parsons. Dan Quinn, the staff, great job with that. That that just shows you how your team can make a difference if you draft well. If you find, you know, sometimes you got to get the draft gods have got to be on your side. But I am super excited for the guys in the front office that those picks worked out for them. It's a reason why your team's uh, going to be in the playoffs right now because the players like that have played outstanding uh, this year for you. 
So this is the part where Jeff apologizes to Cowboys Nation for poo-pooing on the Micah Parsons uh, pick when it happened. He wasn't you, alone. He wasn't, you, <laughs> alone. Yeah. I, he wasn't I alone. I say that jokingly. Jeff, are you willing yeah. to apologize to Micah Parsons and Cowboys Nation after uh, his first team all-pro selection? Yes, I'd love to. Listen, Cowboys Nation, <laughs> I would like to apologize for not knowing that Micah Parsons was a defensive end. I didn't know. <laughs> um, Neither did the yeah. rest of us. Most most of us no, didn't know. I, I did not know. No. <laughs> and the Cowboys deserve all the credit in the world for that. They saw something there that didn't even necessarily on his Penn State tape, like blitzing linebackers on his tape, playing linebackers on his tape, lining up on the edge and – being Von Miller that wasn't on his college tape. So it was a projection by the Cowboys and they got it right. And I think going back to what Brian said, it kind of illustrates why to me football is the best game on planet earth. And it goes in two different ways. Like one, you're about to watch a matchup of two very different teams, a quarterback reliant, throw the ball football team and a team that's like, screw that. Ours isn't that good. So we're going to do things very differently a league where the Baltimore Ravens of the last few years and the Kansas City Chiefs can be two of the best teams, and they do things so differently. And then I take that to the draft in regards to these three players. Like Micah Parsons, Jerry Jones acknowledged, if he was just an off-the-ball linebacker, I wouldn't pick him at 12. But what they did do is they picked the best player that was available to them. With Zach Martin, a lot of people at 16, <clears throat> excuse me, aren't going to be super excited about taking an interior offensive lineman at number 16 overall. The value is not great. It's a Hall of Famer. And then Trayvon Diggs is, well, that is a valuable position that they would have picked earlier if they had an earlier pick in the second round and just kind of fell in their lap. Um, but that's the beauty of it. You know, a lot of teams might not make that pick, might not make a couple of those picks. Because it doesn't, quote, make sense from a positional value standpoint. But the Cowboys have done a really good job of saying, hey, Zach Martin's the best player that's here. You don't go wrong very often if you pick the best player. And the Cowboys have been able to parlay those individuals into terrific football players out of the 50 AP voters. 46 chose Zach Martin, 46 chose Micah Parsons, 33 chose uh, Trayvon Diggs as one of the two cornerbacks. Uh, Jalen Ramsey had 32 uh, votes as far as the all pro corners were concerned. Brian Anger was named to the second team all pro team with 18 votes. AJ Cole, the uh, terrific punter from the uh, the Raiders, uh, was first team all pro for this season. Other housekeeping notes here speaking of drafting and this personnel department, Will McClay is going to be back with this Dallas Cowboys team. He gets a new contract. He will not be, be sought out by other teams as the Cowboys have made sure to lock him up. Gentlemen, from your perspective, Brian, we'll start with you. What is the significance of making sure that the Cowboys were able to lock up Will McClay and what that means for this team personnel-wise going forward and how they want to continue to operate with this team? Yeah, you know, you got to – congratulations to Will for getting that done. He's obviously very comfortable being here. The Joneses appreciate what he's done. Will does a great job of managing the scouts, the coaches, and the Jones family when it comes to that. He calls it the Bermuda Triangle – in a, in, a, in a nice way, not like you're going to go in there and get lost and die. But, you know, he says it's it's something you have to navigate. And I kind of feel like with, with Will, you know, it's going to be really, really important to have somebody at the wheel like a Will McClay again this year. They're likely going to lose Dan Quinn. They're likely going to lose a lot, a lot of their players. It's going to be a big turnover. They're going to be picking on the back end of the, of the draft this year. This is going to be a really, really important draft. They're going to have to figure out their cap situation, their roster. This team is going to look remarkably different when we talk about it uh, next spring. And, uh, you know, having Will McClay in the building, I think, is the absolute right thing. Me personally, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a different guy. I would have, you know, me, I want to go and maybe Jeff and I've talked about this. It's an ego thing. But you maybe you want to go and try and build your own team. And maybe you want to try and hire your own coach. Obviously, Will McClay right now is comfortable doing that, and, and good for him if that's exactly what he wants to do. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a big it's a big uh, big get if you want to say, or a big allowed to stay because Will McClay is a huge part of what they do. Jeff, the importance of Will McClay can't be understated given how successful he's been able to be as far as not only drafting but personnel wise. I think a big part of that this year, and Brian, and I, we've talked about it them going to the dollar store and finding guys like J. Ron Curse yeah. and Keanu Neal and others, Will McClay's importance can't be understated, can it? 
No, and I think it's been like everybody else. Like their free agent signings have been kind of up and down because their money has been limited. So mm-hmm. this year, you found some really good ones. The year before, you're like, yeesh, that was kind of a strikeout. Um, <laughs> ha ha, <but> Clinton Dix. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody they signed couldn't play. Yeah. But uh, no, I think I think ultimately the way that I look at a front office and a guy who's responsible for putting together a roster is – how much trouble do you have to put your team's future in in order to build your team? And if you don't do a good job of drafting and keeping your own guys, then you end up having to sign big contracts to older guys. You end up having to flip draft picks to try to plug holes and the Cowboys. It's probably number one in football. I can't claim to have looked this up. I know once upon a time, this title belonged to the Packers, but they're probably the most homegrown team in football. And the only complaint I would have about it is I wish they were a little less homegrown and didn't give big money to a running back and never gave big money to Jalen Smith. But, you know, they've they've built this thing by identifying talent, drafting talent, keeping their guys around, and they've built one of the better rosters in football. And I think that's incredibly impressive to do that without having to throw around, not once, Amari Cooper, once. They traded, they made a big trade. But outside of that, it's their guys. And that's that's Will McClay leading this crew and identifying talent and making you one of the best at growing your own in the NFL. Well, that gets us to this talented football team taking on a San Francisco 49er team that comes in as a wild card. They beat the Los Angeles Rams in the final week of the season to earn their right into the tournament. Meanwhile, the Dallas Cowboys, who finished – their season at 12 and five were able to win the NFC East. They are the third seed hosting a playoff game. So gentlemen, as we get into our game preview for the 49ers visiting the Dallas Cowboys, let's start on the offensive side with Kyle Shanahan and his football team. Obviously a terrific run game, a powerful run game with guys like Elijah Mitchell, Jeff Wilson, Debo Samuel doing what he does in the run game. But to me, and we'll start with Jeff on this one, the wild card here to me is Jimmy Garoppolo. What version of Jimmy Garoppolo are you going to get in this potential game based on the way that Kyle Shanahan likes to attack teams with the run game and the creativity that he likes to use for his offense? Well, it's it's interesting because ideally, I kind of view the 49ers offense as, and it's a better version of it, but when I watch the Colts play, like they don't want their quarterback to be involved in the game. They want as as little of his fingerprints on the game as they can get. And I think the 49ers are kind of the same way where Jimmy Garoppolo, because they're so efficient and call so many run plays and it works, you have to devote a lot of resources to that. And that gives Jimmy Garoppolo an opportunity to play good football. And a lot of times he does. You know, if you look at yards per attempt, if you look at the efficiency of that offense, a lot of times he'll play pretty good football now. He also takes more sacks than most quarterbacks and turns the ball over at a higher rate, not total interceptions. He only has, I think, 12. But percentage-wise, when he drops back to pass, he throws more picks than most. So, you know, for the Cowboys, your goal is to get Jimmy Garoppolo to be incredibly involved in this game. The 49ers' goal is to have Jimmy Garoppolo not be involved in this game. Can you make it happen? I hope so. Brian, if you're Dan Quinn, how do you think that Kyle Shanahan, who knows you pretty well, worked together for a couple of years? Dan Quinn, a different coordinator, obviously, than what he was as a head coach and when he was with Seattle as a coordinator. But if you're Dan Quinn, how do you think Kyle Shanahan looks to attack your defense this weekend, given the weapons that he has, as we mentioned with Debo Samuel, George Kittle, one of the best tight ends in the NFL going into this game? Yeah, KG, I was talking with some of my gang of seven guys this morning about it. And you know, I'm like, listen, where do you think that maybe the Dan Quinn has an advantage? And I think that even Kyle Shanahan said this, you know, there's some things that Dan Quinn is fundamentally doing different than he had done before when he was with either Seattle or Atlanta, or those kinds of places. So I, I think that maybe that Kyle Shanahan has really had to dig in a little bit more on Dan Quinn and try and figure things out. I'm sure there's some fundamental things. He's like, okay, that's what he's going to do. But then there's also some things. And I think this is why Dan Quinn has had success this year is because honestly, he just hasn't had his, all his guys together. I mean, it's, if you look at it, it's like, you know, the last five, six weeks, he's had his guys together. He went the majority of the season where he was having to do things schematically that was different to make up for the lack of talent that he had in a lot of areas. And you know, I, I think to where 
I think where uh, I think where Kyle Shanahan wants to attack uh, uh, attack Dan Quinn is he probably doesn't feel like that the Cowboys secondary can tackle well enough against his receivers. I mean, Dallas is notorious for the run after the catch. And, you know, if he can find a way, maybe the ball is short, maybe the ball is on screens, maybe the ball is underneath, I think he's going to challenge this Cowboys secondary to make tackles. And if they don't tackle well, then there go the chunk plays. We've seen with the Cowboys that they've given up some chunk plays. They've given up some big plays. You know, they've given up some big plays with some pass interference calls. So, yeah, I I don't, you know, running the football is the obvious thing to say. But if the Cowboys don't tackle well in this game, especially in the secondary, I think that's where I think that's where you're going to see the 49ers try and take advantage of this Cowboys defense. To Brian's point, Debo Samuel ranked second in the NFL with 772 yards after the catch in 2021. He averaged 10.03 yards. Yeah. after contact uh, per reception, which was by far the most in the National Football League among wide receivers. To, you, to your point, if you don't tackle in space in this game, right. this team and the 49ers can hurt you pretty badly with their ability to break tackles, especially with Debo Samuel being as physical as he is as a right. wide receiver there. So with this being said, then let's go to the defensive side of the football how do the San Francisco 49ers look to defend this Cowboys offense relative to the Cowboys being the number one scoring offense in the NFL, the number one total offense in the NFL. They led the league in points this year. All kinds of gaudy numbers that this Cowboys offense put up this year. But although it didn't feel like it during the last maybe six, seven weeks of the season, Brian, we'll start with you on this one. How does Kellen Moore in this offense look to attack Kyle Shanahan in his defense and what they're looking to put forward on Sunday? Yeah, I, I kind of feel like, though, that with Vance Joseph, the defensive coordinator there in San Francisco, uh, if he plays zone coverage against the Cowboys, I have a feeling he's going to get eaten alive in this game. I think that the Cowboys will uh, they will commit to protecting Prescott, whether it's with the offensive line, whether it's max protections with backs, tight ends. It's more important to get the receivers involved in this game and get them going. And I think if the 49ers – they're one of the worst in the league when it comes to, you know, the number of zone snaps that they play. And I, a lot of it has to do with they're scared to death of their cornerbacks. They're scared of their safeties playing coverage. They would they would rather keep things in front of you than rally and tackle. That's kind of their game plan. They don't want to give up the big play. But if you look at the numbers, and Jeff has taught me about looking at numbers it's like Dak Prescott's completion percentage here, though, against man coverage is not as good as it needs to be. And so will the 49ers gamble and say, we'll play man and we'll make Dak have to complete passes against man coverage? And if he can do that, then the 49ers are really in trouble. So, again, my gut feeling is they're probably going to see some man, a little bit of a mix. But, yeah, when they get in that zone coverage, Dak Prescott, these receivers need to wear the 49ers out. So that's two interesting things, Jeff, that Brian brings up, because one that thing comes to my mind is, will the Cowboys have the patience to be able to dink and dunk their way down the field if zone coverage is something that they will be able to use to pick apart this 49ers defense? But more importantly, if they're going to see more man coverage, how important is it then for Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb to win their individual matchups to be able to make things easier for Dak Prescott, or is it something where a guy like Dalton Schultz who could potentially have a big day as well with his trust that Dak Prescott seems to have in him as a pass catcher? Well, I, I think, yeah, depending on what the 49ers show you depends on who I think the Cowboys need to use to hurt the 49ers the most. If you're talking about zone coverage, then to me, you're talking about getting the ball out, letting guys work after the catch. So in that case, the guys I'm looking at, are if they'll let him be involved as much as he should be, Tony Pollard, Cedric Wilson, CeeDee Lamb. Those are the three guys that jump to mind. When you're in zone coverage, get the ball in their hands and let them work. And if you're talking about man coverage, I think the 49ers just come up short. You know, Emmanuel Mosley's probably their best corner. He's okay. They've been forced to play third-round rookie Ambry Thomas, I think because Josh Norman couldn't really play. Uh, and he, you can take advantage of that. Uh, I, and they don't have the horses to cover the Cowboys wide receivers and man coverage, I don't think. But to Brian's point, you may have to prove it because 
you've been better against zone than you have against man. You've been better against the blitz than you have against not seeing the blitz. So I think you're going to see, and it doesn't work like, <clears throat> excuse me. Everybody talks about how this is a bad matchup for the Cowboys. It's a bad matchup for the 49ers too, because their safeties, mm. they want to come down and hit that neither one of their safeties to me is a great deep half or deep field guy. None of their corners is a great cover guy. So if Dak plays well, if you're able to protect, this is a bad matchup for the 49ers too. You could very well find yourself down 14, nothing, eight minutes into the game and going, "Uh Oh, what are we going to do now? Cause they're going to play to stop you with Eric Armstead, Nick Bosa, the front four, Dre Greenlaw and Fred Warner, the linebackers. Like they're going to say you six, that's it. You guys got the run. We're all going to be back here, and when it's a pass play, you're going to drop as well. But they're not they're not equipped to defend the pass very well, and the Cowboys should be able to take advantage of that. San Francisco has allowed opposing quarterbacks to post a passer rating of 97 in 2021. That's the eighth highest passer rating allowed by a defense this year in the National Football League. So that gets us to our X factors then. Obviously, both teams are very good when it comes to specific aspects of their football team. San Francisco could run the ball extremely well. Dak Prescott and this Cowboys offense, one of the best in the NFL in terms of putting points on the board. Jeff, we'll start with you. Give me an X factor on both offense and defense that has to be available and be successful for the Cowboys to get a win against San Francisco on Sunday afternoon. So it's a little bit of a random one, but on offense, I'm actually going to say Cedric Wilson. I think Cedric Wilson will play a big role in what you're doing here because I think Cedric Wilson has a really good connection with Dak Prescott, and I think he's a really good guy at when you just fire it out into the flats, making a guy miss and making some big plays for you. So I'll go Cedric Wilson. And on defense, man, I already want to go backwards and say, no, it's Connor Williams because he has to block Eric Armstead. (laughs) Uh, On defense, give me Tank Lawrence because – the 49ers don't have Mike McGlinchey, who's supposed to be their right tackle. So you get, is it Tom, Tom Compton? And he's had a good year, but you're still talking about the guy that they would not if they had all their guys available. They don't want him playing right tackle. And Tank Lawrence is a really good player. So give me Tank Lawrence going after their right tackle and give me Cedric Wilson making plays on offense. Brian, let's go with offense and then defense for your X factors going into this game. Yeah, I think this game is really going to come down to Dak Prescott myself. And I know it's easy to say about the quarterback. I don't think he can miss in this game, especially if the the Cowboys receivers do a good job of getting open. Jeff talks about Cedric Wilson. He talks about, you know, the others, C.D. Lamb, big game. You know, Dallas offensively at home has been very, very good. I mean, Arizona was the one time. And then also, though, the, uh, the Denver game, they weren't particularly good. But, you know, for most part, these receivers make plays. But it's going to be incumbent on the quarterback to make those throws. You can't get hurried. You can't be rushed. Use your legs. Move when you have to. Make accurate throws. This game's going to come down. This, these teams are pretty evenly matched, and it's but they're not evenly matched at quarterback. Your quarterback needs to be better than their quarterback. And I, I believe that with all my heart because – I think Dak Prescott's capable of having a big game and winning a playoff game against a quality opponent. So I'll say him is my offensive, uh, my offensive guy. I think this is going to come down to how healthy to J. Ron Curse is because I think he's going to play a couple of different roles here. I think he's going to have to play in some coverage against George Kittle. But I'm also thinking when that ball comes downhill, when it's tossed to the outside, if it's a jet sweep. He's going to have to rally to get there. Him, Parsons, Vanderesh, Tank, those guys are going to have to get off blocks and make tackles. They can't, uh, they can't be an indecision. They can't be confused. You know, all those things, I mean, it, they will lead to big plays. But to me, Curse is going to have to be physical in the run game, and he's going to have to be physical in coverage. He's a guy that's shown, hey, he's been able to turn people over tip balls, balls knocked in the air, himself getting interceptions. If if Jimmy Garoppolo gets hurried and is trying to throw the ball to George Kittle and that ball gets knocked in the air, it's a good chance that J. Ron Curse is going to go get it. So I kind of feel like that Dak, J. Ron Curse would be my two X-factor players in this game. I'm going to stick on the lines for this game in terms of the offensive and the defensive lines. For defense, I'm going to go with Randy Gregory because if Trent Williams plays in this game, he's been dealing with an elbow injury. 
if Randy Gregory has to go up against Trent Williams, it could be a long day for Randy Gregory on that side. If he doesn't, if Trent Williams doesn't play, Randy Gregory could find himself potentially having some opportunities to get after the quarterback and put in the kind of pressure on Jimmy Garoppolo that we've been talking about to make him hurry and make some things happen as far as potentially creating turnover. So I'm going to go with Randy Gregory. Offensively, I'm going to go with two guys, actually. I'm going to go, and Jeff alluded to one of them, I'm going to go with Connor Williams and Tyler Biotis because I have a real bad feeling that Eric Armstead is going to look at the two of them and says, oh, it's time for me to go eat today because Eric Armstead is a monster, you know, street. He's a monster. Like these, that defensive line is pretty good, obviously, for the 49ers. So to me, Connor Williams and Tyler Biotis have got to be strong in this game to not allow pressure up the middle because if Eric Armstead can find himself overpowering either one of these guys, it could be a long day up the middle when it comes to this Cowboys offensive line. So those are the guys I'm looking at. We'll see how they fare as far as the trenches are concerned. Before we get out of here today, I want to look at these two coaches, Mike McCarthy, former Super Bowl champion, Kyle Shanahan, former offensive coordinator, worked with Dan Quinn, was in Atlanta in a Super Bowl himself with the San Francisco 49ers, of course, who lost to the Kansas City Chiefs. Who has the coaching advantage in this game when you look at Mike McCarthy and also Kyle Shanahan. Jeff, we'll start with you. Who has the coaching advantage in your mind in this game? I am uh, I am one of the Mike McCarthy defenders and believers. I like Mike McCarthy as a head coach. I think he's a good head coach. I think I would still lean Shanahan, and part of it I will acknowledge is ignorance. Like, I know what Kyle Shanahan does. I know the role he plays in designing the offense and having a hand in that. Uh, I'm a, I'm a fan of Mike McCarthy because he's had success. And I think the players start to sound like him. And when you look at the things that they practice and the time they spend on things and the things he talks about and will tell us about in press conferences, I think McCarthy is a capable and good head coach, but I know that Kyle Shanahan is the designer of an offense that I think is pretty impressive. That dude traded up because he thought his quarterback wasn't good enough to play for him. And now, you know, he's been to a Super Bowl with that guy, and now he's going to try to make another playoff run. So I'll go Shanahan, but I don't think it's a blowout. I, I like Mike McCarthy. Yeah, I you know what? I, I, I will say this. Both, you know, Shanahan's taken his team to a Super Bowl. Um McCarthy has won a Super Bowl, you know, and I think when you start talking about playoff experience and stuff, Mike McCarthy has a big edge here. He really does. And, you know, Mike McCarthy, I mean, he, you know, he, I remember back and it was the anniversary, the seventh year anniversary of the, the catch with Des Bryant and not the 49er Cowboy catch, but, you know, Des Bryant and McCarthy is only challenge he won all year was that challenge. And, you know, you have to, you have to be a sideline manager like that. I, I think that I think in this game, both of these coaches are going to be willing to take chances. The problem is that one is compromised at his field goal kicker and the other is not. And so maybe you're going to have to see Mike McCarthy manage this game a lot different than what Mike Shanahan. Robbie Gold is a good kicker, a veteran kicker, you know, a guy that in perfect conditions like we're going to have at AT AT&T is going to be able to knock field goals home. You know, he doesn't have to worry about his kicker. Now, his punter, Shanahan's punter, is in the concussion protocol. and There's been some problems and stuff. Your punters, as we just talked about, is an all-pro guy. So there's going to be some decisions that you're going to have to make in this football game. And, and I'm not calling it gambling or, you know, chance-taking. It's about managing the game. It's about knowing your team and knowing what needs to be done. I kind of feel like, though, that Mike McCarthy does understand where his team needs to go. And that's all I ask of him. I've been very, very critical of him throughout because there's some things about him when the offense wasn't playing very well. I was like, come on, you're an offensive coach. You've got to find a way to fix this thing. But as far as the game management stuff, I think he's going to manage the game the right way. And that will give the Cowboys advantage in this one. And and hopefully that will be the difference maker. But He's struggling. He's struggling with his field goal and his kicker, and that that can make him go in a totally different direction. Would you like to add something, Jeff? I would, but I need you to. Is there a way to turn off Brian's um, speakers? I don't want him to hear this. Okay, because you nope. know Brian's Brian's Brian an NFL man with a lot of he, experience. He gets to hear this. And too. I'm a 
I'm such a young, handsome, daring man that I just wanted to say, daring for sure, daring for sure. I just wanted to say, I do need Botox. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, what if, what if, ideally in the NFL, you'd rather have a crappy kicker? I'm so sorry. Have, all the time. Yeah. Teams that have a, teams that have a good kicker. It's like, oh man, we we're within a we're in his range. Let's oh, dial it down, boys. Oh, I see where you're going. Mm, if okay. you don't trust your kicker, a little more aggressive, huh? A little more aggressive. Okay. So let me just float the theory that maybe the Cowboys are gonna go four for five on fourth downs. <laughs> and they're gonna go on their three touchdowns for two on all of them and get two or three of them. Let me just float the idea that maybe, maybe having a terrible kicker is awesome. Maybe. <laughs> Once you know he's terrible. Now, yeah, if you uh, pretend he's hey, not terrible, that doesn't work. Look, old let me tell like, you like, this. Like, hold on now. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, let me tell you this. I don't want him to be forced to make a decision where he has to kick one. Mm. He's like, listen, I need points here at 46 yards. And that guy misses. And then that puts the head coach in a bad spot. That That's the only... If this if there's an early extra point miss or an early kick miss, they ain't kicking an extra point, homie. <laughs> they ain't kicking an extra point. We might not be kicking field goals the rest of the day either. Yeah, exactly. They're going for two. First touchdown, KG. Watch. Oh, okay. Predictions. Well, that's a beautiful segue to our last portion then. Predictions as far as this game is concerned. Now you guys will be going through your game predictions as far as the G Bag Nation is concerned. But how are you feeling? confidence wise and are you confident enough to give a prediction on how this thing will go on Sunday we'll start with Brian Brian how are you feeling confidence wise and prediction wise for the game on Sunday yeah I think this is going to be a very difficult game really for both sides I mean talking to guys this morning it was kind of split which direction they understand that San Francisco is a difficult out and so is Dallas I mean this thing could go either way I I do I feel like that the Cowboys are going to find a way to win this game. Maybe early when I started looking at San Francisco, I'm like, mm, maybe not. Maybe San Francisco's got better players and all that. Uh, you know, but there's problems that the 49ers are going to have with you. And there's problems that they're going to have uh, that, that you're going to have with them. And so I, I kind of feel like that Dallas will overcome uh, these problems and they find a way to win this thing 28 to 23. Um, just kind of one of those things where, it's going to need a stop late. It's going to need something to happen. Uh, maybe you get the Jimmy Garoppolo turnover, but I kind of feel like that Dallas finds a way to get some points out of this thing. 28-23. Jeff, Jeff's not feeling that. He's not He's not feeling that at all. Maybe the win, but maybe not score-wise. Is that, is that the feeling that you're getting, Hoodie Jeff? Is that is that the feeling that you're getting right now? No, he stole my score. Look. Oh, okay. I already put it out there yesterday. Here's how the Cowboys' points are going to work. They're going to score a touchdown. They're going to go for two. They're going to get it. They're going to score a touchdown. They're going to go for two. They're going to miss it. They're going to score a touchdown. They're going to go for two. They're going to get it. They're going to go two of three going for two. They're never going to kick an extra point. They're going to kick two field goals. They'll both be good. And the final score will be 28-23. And the way you get there is eight plus eight and six and three and three. That's how we get to 28. So you're just trying to remove Greg Zerline as much as you can. From the I think that that's. Play. I think Jerry Jones told us they're not kicking extra points, and maybe I'm a crazy person. But he, <laughs> when he talked about how we know that our kicker isn't any good, and we have a plan for that, I think that plan is he's struggling on extra points, not necessarily field goals. He's 83 percent on field goals. That's fine. That's what kickers do. Except Justin Unless Tucker. Unless Justin Tucker, right? Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he's missing extra points. I think they're going to take that out of the equation. I think they're going for two, and I think they're going to go two for three going for it, and they're going to win the game 28-23. You know, it's funny you say that. Every time I think about Justin Tucker, how many times does Harbaugh go for two? It seems like he goes for it all the hmm. time. So I, hmm. That's so because he needs, Harbaugh he needs, is hmm. – He only needs Tucker to kick 63-yard field goals. That's the only hmm. reason he has him around. That's because Harbaugh's – Harbaugh's my guy. Like, he's not yeah. even an analytics guy because he'll do things that don't line up with what the numbers say to do. Yeah. But what he'll mm. do is he'll literally just ask his player, like, hey, what do you think? And he's yeah, like, what do you think? Yes, I want to go. go. And he's like, cool, let's do yeah, it. Let's go. Yeah. And his team is sitting at home in the playoffs this year. Sir. So, yeah. Sometimes they win a couple that. more games. This all they needed was a couple of those two point conversions to go their way, and they'd have been right there. So, you get your quarterback, you get your MVP quarterback hurt, and your season's yeah. probably in trouble. Yeah, that's true, too. 
I'm going to go with the Cowboys 31 27 in this game. I think it's going to be a fairly high scoring affair. As you both gentlemen know, all the teams are good in the playoffs. These teams are going to be tough outs and whether or not you find a way to blow. Well, except the Steelers. Hey, I like Ben Roethlisberger's thought process. Hey, we got no chance to win this game. So let's just go out and have fun and just see what happens. You never know what could happen. And when, Hey, you know who also didn't have a chance to win a playoff game? Tim Tebow. And you saw what happened that day. He so, threw hey, one slant the whole day. 80 and yards guess what? It, it, and it worked. And it worked for a playoff win. Uh, but, yeah, I'm going to go with the Cowboys 31-27. I think Dak Prescott and this offense find a way to exploit these corners. Obviously, the physical run game of the 49ers is going to be something to watch. Can the Dallas Cowboys match the physicality? That's been a large talking point this entire week about these two teams, the quote-unquote physicality of the 49ers versus the finesse of the Dallas Cowboys of which one of these styles will play out and win. I do think the Cowboys have much more talent, and I think they will actually handle their business at home in what could be a very loud AT&T Stadium. I'm not talking about Cowboys fans. San Francisco 49ers fans show up for their football team, and that could be a lot of the same case on uh, on Saturday. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I talked to somebody in the Bay Area, and it's a member of the – there's a group. There's like a a traveling group that for the 49ers – and they're expecting 1,500 people in this, in this Bay Area group to make the trip. So at least they, 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 have, they have, I think there was 5,000 or so members, but at least they think at least 1,500 of those 5,000 will make the trip to Dallas for this game. So with the Cowboy fans wearing white and them wearing red, mm. you'll, you'll see. You'll see who, who the, where the crowd is in this game for sure. This game could, of course, can be heard on 105 through the fan with the voice of America's team, Brad Sham, Babe Laufenberg, and Christy Scales patrolling the sidelines. Pre-game starts at 12.30 with Ari Timken and Brian Broaddus. They will have your pre-halftime and post-game shows as the Cowboys take on the San Francisco 49ers. This game will also get the CBS treatment with Jim Nance, Tony Romo, and Tracy Wolfson. Interesting note about this game, gentlemen. Tony Romo, Jimmy Garoppolo, and also Mike Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan's father, all went to Eastern Illinois. So yeah. um, as somebody pointed out to me on Twitter, so you mean to tell me Tony Romo gets to sit there and watch the dude that broke all his Cowboys records take on the guy that broke all his records at Eastern Illinois and Jimmy Garoppolo. So, hmm, that's that's actually a pretty good. I have a good. note. Oh, I have oh, a you, note. Oh, you this have is, a note? This is about to be a good note. I, I have a point oh, okay. what Jeff's going to say here. Yeah. The last time Jim Nance called a Cowboys playoff game. Oh. There you go. There you was you go. January 16th. 1994. Oh, I was my. there. They beat the Packers 27 to 17 that day. Yep. They went on to win the Super Bowl. Oh, the last my. time Jim Nance called a Cowboys playoff game. And it was on January 16th, which this one will be too. Oh my. Wow. I was on I was on the sidelines taking the L that day for your uh, beloved Green Bay Packers there, right? We were just waiting for you to come to Dallas. That's all, Brian. That's all we were waiting yeah. for. And- yeah. <laughs> We look forward to this game on Sunday afternoon inside of AT&T Stadium. We appreciate you joining us all season long. Well, let me not say that because that's ominous. Now, hopefully, we're going to be doing a few more of these episodes uh, as the Cowboys continue their uh, playoff run, hopefully, after Sunday. But you can find us all on Twitter. You can find Jeff on Twitter at JC1053. You can find Brian on Twitter at Brian Broaddus. You can find me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. Again, subscribe to 105 Through the Fan here on YouTube and all of our social media platforms. And, of course, 105ThroughTheFan.com. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me and Brian on this uh, super show playoff edition of the Boys Collective, Jeff. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. I love you. You know that. I love you, too. For Jeff Cavanaugh, the Super Bowl winning scout, Brian Broaddus. My name is Kevin Gray. This has been the Boys Collective episode number 41. We will talk to you on Monday after the Cowboys take on the 49ers. We appreciate it. And Jeff uh, and Brian, Brian, I'll talk to you on Monday for sure. Great, boys. All right.